Battle of the Gullet took place in the Gullet in 130 AC, during the early stages of the Dance of the Dragons, the ferocious Targaryen Civil War. It remains among the bloodiest sea battles in all of the history of the Seven Kingdoms, but also the first time so many dragons were used in a single battle together. House Valarian blockaded the Gullet and thus controlled access to Blackwater Bay. This resulted in supply lines by sea and all trade being cut off from King's Landing, which was currently in the hands of King Aegon II and the Greens. After the earlier assault on Harrenhal by Prince Daemon Targaryen and further blows to the Greens, Otto Hightower, the hand of the King to Aegon II, had hatched a plan to break the Valyrian fleet's blockade. Otto reached out across the narrow sea to the old enemies of Prince Daemon Targaryen from his time warring in the Stepstones, the Troyarchy, hoping to persuade them to move against the Sea Snake and the Blacks. Otto's plan took time, and Aegon II eventually ran out of patience with his grandfather's caution, replacing him as hand with Sir Criston Cole. However, the schemes of Otto did eventually bear fruit, as the High Council of the Troyarchy accepted his offer of alliance in Tyrosh. Ninety warships commanded by Admiral Shakaro Lothar of Lys swept from the Stepstones under the banner of the Three Daughters, bending their oars for the gullet. It is important to note that during the same time on Dragonstone, it was decided by Prince Jacaris Valarian, his half-brothers, Prince Aegon and Viserys Targaryen, would be fostered with the Prince of Pentos until their mother, Queen Rhaenyra, had secured the Iron Throne. The princes departed on a Pentoshi cog called the Gay Abaddon towards the end of 129 AC, with the Sea Snake sending seven of his warships as escorts, Gay Abaddon encountered the Triarchy's fleet during its progress to Pentos, which had sailed up the gullet, catching them totally unawares. Given the sheer number of the Triarchy's fleet, the Gay Abaddon was taken captive, and her escort sunk or captured. Possessed only of a dragon egg, Viserys had no way of escaping from the cog and was made a captive, or presumed dead. Prince Aegon, however, did manage to escape the Gay Abaddon on his young dragon Stormcloud. Sailors attempted to bring them down, and Stormcloud was wounded by arrows and scorpion bolts. Nevertheless, they flew to Dragonstone, where Aegon delivered the news of the threat from the east. Stormcloud died at Dragonstone from his wounds, but doubtless saved the prince's life. The true battle began on the fifth day of the new year of 130 AC. The Lysini Admiral divided his fleet for the attack. One pincer was to enter the gullet south of Dragonstone, the other to its north. In the early morning hours of the fifth day of 130, battle was joined. Shikaro's warships swept in, with the rising sun hidden behind them. Hidden by the glare, they took many of Lord Valarian's galleys unawares, ramming some and swarming aboard others with ropes and grapples. Much to the surprise of the Valarian fleet, they left Dragonstone unmolested. However, the southern squadron fell upon the shores of Driftmark, which was guarded by far fewer ships. They sent fire ships into the harbour to set ablaze to any ships that remained. By mid-morning, Spice Town was burning, whilst the Mirish and Taroshi troops battered at the very doors of high tide. When Prince Jacaris swept down upon a line of Lysini galleys on Vermax, a rain of spears and arrows rose up to meet him. The sailors of the Triarchy had faced dragons before, whilst warring against Prince Daemon in the Stepstones. No man could fault their courage. They were prepared to meet Dragonflame with such weapons as they had. Kill the rider and the dragon will depart, their captain and commanders had told them. One ship took fire, and then another. Still, the brave men of the three cities fought on, until a shout rang out, and they looked up to see more winged shapes coming around the dragon mount, and turning towards them. It was one thing to face a young, juvenile dragon, another to face five fully grown, battle-hardened ones. A silver-winged sheep-stealer, sea-smoke, vermithor, and their dragon-seed riders descended upon them. The men of the Troyarchy felt their courage desert them. The line of warships shattered as one galley after another turned away. The dragons fell like thunderbolts, spitting balls of fire, blue and orange, red and gold, each brighter than the next. Ship after ship burst asunder or was consumed by flames. Screaming men leapt into the sea, shrouded in fire. Tall columns of black smoke rose up from the water. All seemed lost. All was lost. Several differing tales were told afterwards of how and why the dragon fell. Maybe it was the courage of its young rider. Maybe it was the inexperience of youth. 
Vermax flew too low and crashed down into the sea. Some claimed a crossbowman put an iron bolt through his eye, but this version seems suspiciously similar to the way that Maraxis met her end long ago in the Sands of Dawn. Another account tells us that a sailor in the crow's nest of a Mirish galley cast a grapple at Vermax as he was swooping through the fleet. One of its throngs found purchase between two scales and was driven deep by the dragon's own considerable speed. The sailor had curled his end of the chain about the mask and the weight of the ship and the power of Vermax's wings tore a long jagged gash in the dragon's belly. The dragon shrieked with rage and was heard off as far as Spice Town, even through the clangor of battle. His flight jerked to a violent end and Vermax went down smoking and screaming, clawing at the water. Survivor said he struggled to rise, only to crash headlong into a burning galley. Wood splintered. The mask came tumbling down. The dragon, thrashing, became entangled in the rigging. When the ship heeled over and sank, Vermax sank with her. It is said that Jacaris Valarian let free and clung to a piece of smoking wreckage for a few heartbeats till some crossbowmen began losing quarrels at him. The prince was struck once, and then again. More and more Mirishmen brought crossbows to bear, and then finally, one quarrel took him through the neck as Jace was swallowed by the sea. The battle in the gullet raged into the night, north and south of Dragonstone, and remains amongst the bloodiest sea battles in all of history. Shikara Lotha had taken a combined fleet of 90 Mirish Lysini and Tairoshi warships from the Stepstones. 28 survived to limp back home, all but three crewed by Lysini. In the aftermath, the widowers of Mir and Tyrosh accused the Admiral of sending their fleets to destruction while holding back his own beginning the quarrel that would spell the end of the Triarchy two years later, when the three cities turned against each other in the Daughters' War. Though the attackers bypassed Dragonstone, no doubt believing that the ancient Targaryen stronghold was too strong to assault, they exacted a grievous toll on Driftmark. Spice Town was brutally sacked, the bodies of men, women and children butchered in the streets and left as fodder for gulls and rats and carrion crows. Its buildings burned. The town would never be rebuilt to the same extent it once was. High Tide was also put to the torch as well, and with it much of the treasure the sea snake had brought back from the east were consumed by the fires. His servants cut down as they tried to flee the flames. The Valarian fleet lost almost a third of its strength, and thousands died. Yet none of these losses were felt so deeply as that of Prince Jacaris Valarian, Prince of Dragonstone, and heir to the Iron Throne. It is written that when the Sea Snake was congratulated on his victory, the old man said, If this be victory, I pray I never win another. With the damage done to Driftmark and Spice Town, the loss of much of the Valarian fleet, the death of Prince Jacaris and his dragon Vermax, and Prince Viserys Targaryen taken captive, presumed dead by both sides. It's hard to really say who won the battle, and ultimately it's very subjective, with both the Blacks and the Greens claiming some form of victory from it. But ultimately the battle was very costly for both sides, and could only nominally be considered a victory for the Greens, due to the death of Rhaenyra's eldest son and the sacking of Spice Town, and in turn weakening the ability of House of Valarian's fleet with the Sea Snake's personal wealth harshly damaged, thanks to the fires at High Tide. The Greens, however, had failed in their strategic goal of the battle, to break the hold of the Valarian fleet on the east coast of Westeros, and restore supply lines and trade to King's Landing. Moreover, the Greens' allies in the southern three cities took such heavy losses they could play no further part in the Dance of the Dragons. Mm -hmm.